Hey guys, it's Chad from the Teach Better team, and I am here with Jen Molitor, the one and the only. Um, tonight, we are here to answer your questions. We are here to help you with your grid inquiries, um, and we are just here to see how you guys are doing. So how are you doing tonight, Jen? Doing awesome. Summer. <laughs> <laughs> so Jen just shared with me, um, she's the, a brand new principal at a school and she's actually doing this live from her brand new building. So Jen, does it feel good to kind of be settling into your new building, get to kind of unpack your stuff and kind of lay your roots a bit? Absolutely. I painted a wall and I'm putting my, my room together. So it feels, it feels great. Uh, that's absolutely awesome. That's that's classic Jen style. She's going to go in. She's going to make it her own. She's going to make it work. I love it. That's absolutely fantastic. Nikki, how every, how's everyone going? Kate, Kate uh, Clayton is here. Um, Brianna's saying hello. A lot of people are kind of joining us and watching. So if you guys have questions, make sure you post them. I'd love to see where you're posting from. So if you just give us a quick uh, city state. Um, with where you're posting from. And if you're joining us live, if you could just do a quick hashtag live, that would be awesome. If you're watching the replay of this, do a hashtag replay. I just wanna see kind of how many people watch this afterwards and how many people are watching live. But please, please, please post your questions. So Maggie Gifford also said, congrats, Jen. Jackie Mohan, great to see you. So today, we are going to be talking about something really important and something I've been getting a lot of texts and emails and questions in our live workshops about, and that is, how do I start a grid if we start remotely and I've never done it with my students before, right? Like, like so we always talk about, this is a really hard transition for students. It's a transition for teachers too. So a lot of teachers think that because they're not in person or if they're starting the year remotely or in some weird hybrid, that they're not gonna be able to like set these routines or set these expectations. And something I often tell teachers is you absolutely can. So I see a bunch of people posting if they're live and where they're from. I absolutely love the interaction guys. That's absolutely fantastic. And someone just said, it'll be great to know how to start this remotely. So the truth is, guys, there's not really a huge secret to starting this remotely. It's actually what we usually tell people when they're starting it live, and that is start with a getting to know you or an intro grid is something I would say. Would you agree with that, Jen? Like we tell a lot of teachers to start with like a non-academic grid. I think you can do the same thing remotely, right? Absolutely. Yep. And, and it's about... For me, it's really about thinking, and Ray Heward is doing an amazing live webinar right now, like we're in the middle of it, um, on creating an introduction grid. And one of the things that Ray's talking about in this course, I've had the chance to sit in on a couple of them, and one of the things we always tell people is, think about what you need to get your students to do when you set up your year. Maybe they need to set up their accounts, maybe they need to do some logistical things, maybe they need to learn their locker combination. You have to do all these things anyway. Why not put some of these things into a grid, right? Then by the time they're done with the first three days, first five days, first week going through this grid, they already know how to do it. Now, we always talk about those logistical things, Jen, but it's been a really long year for a lot of students. And I think there's one thing that teachers also need to consider, and that is SEL um, in relationships, especially right now. So we need to build these relationships. So you're just stepping into a leadership role. What would you like your teachers focusing on in the first, let's say three to five days of school? Do you want them just going into the textbook day one? Or like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, wh where do you want their minds to be at as they prep for that first couple of days? I think no matter where we are, whether it's remote or in person, building relationships, and I think two weeks. I mean, I, I especially yeah. if you're in person for the first few weeks, I, there you never know if we're going to have to go virtual at any time. So I say build the heck out of those relationships. Kids are missing school. They haven't been there in so long. My daughter is eight, and we went for a walk the other day with our new puppy and our puppy met a new dog and our puppy was crazy jumping up and down wagging her tail I mean, like I couldn't keep her on uh, on the leash very well and my daughter 
and looks at me and she goes, that's what I'm going to be like at school when I see my friends again. And I was like, oh, thanks for the heads up. So, you know, when kids come back, like they're going to be like running and maybe like puppies. I don't know when they see each other. So I think just really finding out where they are and building those relationships, loving them, um, just building the case that you are there for them, whether it be, you know, we're going to do some academics, but I'm also here as your teacher and I want to get to know you too. So super important. So Danielle just said she's attending Ray's intro class and she's been able to get some great ideas on how to start the year right. And really it's about starting any year, right? Whether you read Wong and Wong first days of school or you, you're doing something a little more innovative and maybe a little more new, even though like Wong and Wong right here, you still have to build those relationships because the truth is, and I know you know this, Jen, um, kids don't learn from people they don't like. I mean, like, like that's just the honest truth, right? Um, we have to build those relationships. We have to build that trust. And I also love now that like from this leadership perspective, giving your teachers the go ahead to take the first two weeks to build those relationships, to reform those bonds. Because think about it like that, and you brought up a great point. You don't know if you're gonna have to switch directly back to remote learning like in three weeks. Like we don't know if that's gonna happen. So if you don't build those relationships as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible, you may not get to build them in person, right? So I really, really love that you're, you're focusing on that. Um, so Mark Horner says it's definitely going to be uh, strange. Almost have to teach our students new ways to connect and communicate. Absolutely. So Mark Horner, I'm going to call you out a little bit, buddy. Um, in our um, Teach Better Ambassador Voxer channel, Mark threw out this awesome question. And Mark is a fantastic teacher. I love how passionate he is. He's always pursuing better. The guy lives the Teach Better mindset. I absolutely love it. And if you can catch his live videos, about like winning the morning, they're absolutely fantastic. So shout out to you, Mark. But Mark asked the question, he goes, I love high-fiving students and kind of like chest bumping with my students and giving them hugs when they need it kind of things. Like, like, and I was the same way as a teacher, like but when it was appropriate and when it made sense, like some of, the, some of the kids I taught never got hugs or high fives at home, right? So like that was the only one they were getting. But now we have to stay six feet apart. So like, what do we do when we can't kind of keep those connections? Um, and, and I think that was a really great question that he posed. Do you have any thoughts on that? I have a couple thoughts, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Like if you normally are a high five or handshake teacher, like are there any other ways? What are some ways you'd like to see teachers connecting with students in those first few weeks? I like the idea of giving a kid the kids a choice. You know, I, I've seen all these little welcome videos with how to greet. Um, and there's some different things going around, like giving a peace sign or a special signal, um, or even mirroring each other. You know, somebody does a funky move and you do the same move. Um, just, yeah. but something that makes the kid you know, like you. I get you, and that's something that that makes me feel like you understand me and care about me. I love it. I absolutely love that. And that was actually really similar to the conversation we were having when that question was posed. It was like, even if you can't give them an actual high five, maybe, um, I think it's them knowing you want to connect that's the important part, right? So like, we're all aware of the situation we're in, regardless of the age of the student, they know something's different. So you going up to a student and go, I just want you to know, I'd love to give you a high five every single day. I'd love to give you a hug. I'd love to bump elbows or do all that stuff, but I'm, I'm not allowed. But instead, you know what? We're going to do some air high fives. Can everyone do an air high five? Or maybe figuring out a different little dance to do six feet apart uh, from each student. Like something that's like allows you, like you said, Jen, to connect with those students. Because I think it's really about them knowing them knowing that you want to connect, them knowing that you wish you could connect more so that they can kind of break down some of those walls. After that, it's about just having fun with it and breaking down some of those barriers. So I think so eye contact is really important too. Oh yeah, especially if, if we're like this. Right? 
<laughs> Absolutely eye contact. So, so Kim McBriar said she watched the end of the, the Pirates game and they did foot bumps. And I love that. The Indians did it as well. I'm actually a Pittsburgh fan, Kim, so shout it out there. Um, but I think that there, there are ways to respect the guidelines. There are ways to um, kind of work through these things and still connect with students. But remember, like you're connecting with your students on an emotional level. It doesn't have to be on that physical level necessarily. Even when you when you look them in the eye, like you said, when you hear them, when you give their voices value, and when you listen when they need you to, like those are just as effective as high fives and hugs any day. Especially if you're making those things. Um, uh, very explicit for your students, okay? So Danielle says she likes the special signal idea. Um, I know I'm going to miss my secret handshake of the year. So Danielle, let's talk about a secret handshake of the year. So instead of your secret handshake of the year, imagine if you did like a secret COVID dance, right? Like it can still be, it can still be that secret between you and the kids. And Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really just about, to me at least, the connections, right? It's really just about establishing those connections. And we can even give air hugs. I think kids would think, some kids, you know, depending on the level, would think that's yeah. cute to give them a little air hug. Like, come on, you know. You know what? I think some middle and high schoolers think that's cute too. So I'm just saying, like... I'm telling you, I taught middle school for long enough. Like those kids still need connections. They just can't tell you they think it's cool to connect. Like that's the difference, right? They still crave it just as much. They just won't tell you that. So you have to kind of break it down. Kim said Pittsburgh played Cleveland. So when it comes to baseball, Kim, I'm actually a Pittsburgh and a Cleveland fan. Um, just a little cat out of the bag type thing, but I root for all of Pittsburgh sports. Um, so Livia Chan said um, she's just jumping in and we all need to smile and express uh, in our eyes, especially if we're wearing masks, okay? So one cool thing I saw that healthcare workers are currently doing, and I thought this would translate really well into education, is they're wearing buttons with their faces on them. So I want you to think about that. Like, so like each of them has like a round button that they wear and it has a picture of their face because like this part of their face is always, <laughs> is always covered. Um, so I really, really just uh, uh, think about that uh, a lot. We do kitty waves, like uh, the kitty statues, like this I think is what she's talking about. I think that's what Kim is talking about. <sighs> So someone really liked the photo pin idea. Um, I think that's a viable idea. I don't know. I don't know. It feels like a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like so there's something, I think, it, I think it was Livia was saying about smiling. Talking over you. Um, so when we, you know, we have a mask on. I, I um, saw a post about a mom who was te teaching her daughter uh, what it looked like when she was smiling. So she would, you know, she would say, look at my eyes. This is me. I'm not smiling. And now look, like look for the creases in the eye. So just teaching them some of those cues to let them like, I'm so proud of you, you know, something like that. So to read our eyes a little bit more to get our expressions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, like, I think what all this comes back to, to me, is really being explicit about these things. Being explicit about the fact that you wish you could do X, Y, and Z, but you can't. So we're gonna work on this, the next best thing we can do, and we're gonna make the best of it. So Beth Moore, who's an awesome uh, music teacher, um, said that her mask has a smile on it. Beth, that's awesome, I absolutely love it. Um, it's really hard to give a teacher look, right when your mask is smiling at the kid all the time right i'm just <laughs> maybe <laughs> depending on the, on the mood right just like mad eyes happy happy face that would be kind of fun yeah. shannon bogle says can i put a julia roberts picture on my button shannon you do whatever you want you do you shannon <laughs> all right so i think we've talked a lot about a lot about kind of how to connect with students from an SEL standpoint. But I also think we do need to talk about some of those logistics, right? So once those pieces are in yep. place, once you've connected with those students and you wanna start your grid, 
which you can get to know your students with some of the activities on your introduction grid. You could have them do interest surveys. You could have them play fun games. You could have them tell interesting things about themselves. You could have think pair shares, um, all, all sorts of things like that. But you also want to think about this is something I've been preaching a lot, and I, I don't mean to beat this dead horse, but I think it needs beaten just because of how important it is. We need to plan for the most restrictive environment, and we need to prepare our students to thrive in that environment. So I think if, I think every teacher should be planning to need to go to remote at some point next year. We don't know when it's going to be, if it's going to be, depending on your area, right? But if your students are going to need to set up Google Classroom, if they're gonna to need to turn in documents, if they're gonna to need to know how to type emails, like those are also things you could put in your introduction grid. So you could easily create a task on your grid, something like write me an email and tell me about your summer. You know what I mean? And then click send. And once you send it, you're done with that box. You've proven that you can do it. And then, cause I see teachers all the time that they're like, my kids would write the email in the subject line. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like weird stuff that we don't think about but if you take the time to explicitly show them how to set up their vocabulary account how to set up their google classroom how to access parts of their textbooks and things like that you can build all those things into that grid so by the time you're done with it they are ready to go right absolutely and Jordan Amy says she's looking for ideas for gauging kids' emotional states while virtual. So, you know, when we talk about when we have the kids and we want to build those relationships, so if we're virtual when we're starting, I'm thinking of um, having small group Zoom sessions or even one-on-one, -on -one, you know, where you get, build that relationship with the kids and say, listen, I'm here and I know this is so funny because we're on a computer, but here are some things you can expect from me and just set that stage and let them know how much you care and say, if you ever need me, here are some ways that you can reach out to me. If you're feeling worried or scared or nervous, give them all of those resources. And I think you can do that whole group or if you feel like there's some kids you may wanna check in one-on-one, -on -one, then you know I, I would set that up. But I think as far, I, I don't, don't know, I, I agree with you. I don't know that I would do a Google forum depending on the age, but you can absolutely do small groups with Zoom or one-on-one. -on -one. So just wanted to throw that out there. Absolutely. So Jordan from Fort Worth, Texas, just, just signed in. I think you just mentioned her. She even said hashtag live, which I absolutely love. So once again, tell us where you're viewing from and put hashtag live or hashtag replay. That way we just know where everyone's coming from. Or if you watch this tomorrow morning, then we know that too. So we can reply. So um, absolutely. So Van Scott just said, Hey Van, I hope you're doing a fantastic tonight, sir. Um, so another thing to think about, I think, is uh, the in terms of those emotional stages, there's a ton of apps that can, can be used. Things like Flipgrid survey questions, things like Seesaw videos, um, all sorts of like options. There are also some specific SEL tools that will allow students to tell you like emotionally where they're at. So like you can use a, an emotional kind of barometer and like before you start class, they can tell you how they're doing that day. I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm, I'm right in the middle, I, I, I feel okay. So um, there's a lot of, of options you have in terms of gauging where uh, students are at emotionally, which can be a huge help. But the best way, honestly, I think I agree with you, Jen, is like trying to connect with them in small groups on, in the, as close to one-on-one -on -one as possible. If you are using Zoom, something we've been doing really effectively in our in our um, webinars is breakout rooms okay so like if you have a big zoom session you can literally and there's 20 kids you can create five groups of four kids and the way you do this is you give them a topic or a task to talk about right then you start the breakout rooms and you as the teacher can then go to each room and spend five minutes talking to each group right um, and what you can also do is really set the standard for how you expect them to act in breakout rooms, right? Um, you can you can start setting some of those expectations if you're going to need to use this later in the year, but you can use it, like you said, Jen, to kind of gauge where they're at, to go, hey, guys, just wanted to talk to you in a smaller group, just introduce myself again. This is who I am. This is how you can contact me if you ever need any help. This is how you get a hold of me. And I think that's great. 
So just so you know, Jen, we have Canada, Providence, Rhode Island, Los Angeles, California, Billings, Montana, and I'm pretty sure Van Scott's in Florida. So we got like, this is a national live we're doing right now. Uh, actually international to count Canada. Um, thanks, Lydia, by the way. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so what else could you put in an introductory again? Like if I'm a teacher right now going, I have my first unit done. Um, what else can I think about putting into an introductory grid? Like what are those first week, second week type things you want to do with your students? So one thing I was just thinking for the, the beginning, you know, when we're at school, we teach the kids where to turn in papers, um, just all those logistics of the room. Well, when they're home, they still know need to know where to turn things in and where is a good place to work. We have our workplace at school, but where do you do work at home? Um, what does you know your computer space look like? What do you need to do your homework? That kind of stuff. So even one of the options can be tell me about your workspace at home. You know what are the pros? What are the cons about your space? What could you do to improve it so that you're more comfortable? Um, things like that. Um, even problem solving the what to do if you can't get hold of me or what to do if Zoom isn't working or just kind of those FAQs or helping the kids problem solve before all that stuff happens. Because we, at this point, I think we know things that tend to, to go wrong and we can maybe be proactive about that and build that in. It, more in the beginning, I would say. I love that idea. That That is brilliant, Jen. So like rehearsing, I don't want to say like a fire drill, but rehearsing like a Zoom breakdown. Right. Like, so I'm going to pretend like I'm the teacher. We're all in a zoom meeting. I'm going to pretend like everything shuts down and I'm going to sign everybody out. Can we all get back in within five minutes or two minutes or whatever it is? You can even make it like a game. Like let's pretend like zoom shut down. What do you do? Always use the same link. I'm going to open up the room. Like, you know, like figure all that out um, so that they can, they can be successful. Right. Um, so I love that, like rehearse the unexpected so that when it does happen, they don't freak out and go, well, I guess I'm done for the day. <laughs> yeah. You know, all those questions that they, that care, kids and parents had before, you know, like parents, how much should I help my kids with homework? Um, so even like setting the stage with kids. So you're stuck on an assignment. You know, if you ask your mom, she's going to get upset <laughs> because she doesn't know how to help you or she doesn't know that way. What do you do? So even brainstorming things like that so that at home, the relationships aren't bad, you know, because you've got these yeah. parents that want to help. And But if kids know, you know, this, my teacher said this might happen. Here are some strategies I can use. <laughs> Absolutely. I also think along with that, Jen, thinking about, thinking about sort of your communication strategy and making explicit like when you're going to communicate and when you are not going to communicate. Right. So I think a lot of teachers felt like, and you guys can tell me if you, uh, if you agree in the comments or not here. Um, and if you're just joining us, put hashtag live. If you're watching this on the replay, put hashtag replay. Um, so if, if you don't tell your students when you won't respond, you're increasing their stress level. If you don't tell your parents when you're not going to respond, you're increasing their stress level. So it's really, really important, okay? It's really, really important that you go, after six o'clock, no one's getting an email back. I don't care what it says. And I will start answering emails maybe an hour before school starts. So like 8 a.m. or something like that. Like what, whatever that is for you, you know what I mean? Because if you don't set that standard, if you don't set that standard, you're gonna be working 14 hour days, right? Like, like, like you're just not going to be able to turn off because you're going to set. So what I, I guess what I'm telling you, and this is actually, um, this is actually a, uh, a, a good tip for, for, for anyone um, that deals with outside people. It's like set the expectation for how and when you will communicate. If you respond to everything immediately, you will ex be expected to always respond to things immediately. So, if, like, so it's just one of those things make sure your communication strategy is consistent and make sure that you're, you're not being unrealistic because you don't want to start the year and be replying to everything in five seconds and then staying up till midnight. Now, all of a sudden, everyone thinks you're going to do that all the time. You want to set those expectations and be very, very clear about what those standards are. And that's honestly, Jen, to me, that builds more trust. 
right? Like I know that I know that we want to respond immediately and we want to be responsive to our students, but like when we can't do that and they think we can, we create stress and we create distrust. But if we tell every student, if I say, Jen, if you email me at 807, I am not going to email you until 7 a.m. the next morning. You're not, there's no way you're getting an email back. So just don't look for it. Don't think about it because you don't have to worry about it now. Um, so I don't know. So that's, um, to me, that's really important. Like setting those, uh, communication parameters and what's to be expected. So another idea for a box on your intro grid or one of the first grids is to have the, the kids read your, the expectations you have for yourselves or what they can expect from you. You know, I promise I will always be available on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 12 and 3. Right. I promise I'll always have a Zoom meeting. So all the things to expect from me. And then their assignment would be what can I expect from you? So I right. promise that, I, you know, those kind of things so that we have this way you can expect and I can expect and we agree upon that. Oh, yes. So much awesomeness in that, right? Student-teacher contracts. Um setting those expectations, having them be a part of that conversation, right? And I love what you just said. You said expectations. You did not say the R word, which is rules, because students do not need more rules. They just need expectations. And I think this is a huge misconception, right? Teachers think that they can't smile till Christmas, and they need to set all the rules. Day one, super harsh. However, that's a very teacher-centered way to look at it right? Like that's a very just like top down. This is my room. This is how it goes. And like for a long time, that was sort of like the way to be as a teacher for, for like, like, you know, for the better part of a century, right? Um, but now as we're looking at these SEL needs, if we're looking at student ownership and, and student uh, centered classrooms, Mark Horner loves your idea, by the way, which is awesome. Um, it's one of those things where like they need to have a stake in that, right? Like if your expectations for them and their expectations for themselves are totally misaligned, you're not going to be happy all year. <laughs> it's going to be the longest year ever. But if you, I love that because if you establish that in the first two weeks of the year and you go, Hey, I messed up. I wasn't meeting my expectations and you show them you can be vulnerable. You show them that you're not perfect. The hope would be you're modeling that, right? So then when one of them isn't meeting the expectations, instead of jumping all over them, instead of getting angry, you can simply go, you know, I'm really disappointed you're not living up to the expectations we set. So let's talk about how we can do that next time. Or is there a reason that, is there something I didn't do to meet my expectations that caused you not to perform at your best, right? So like having those dialogues, I think is huge. And I love that, Jen. Um, that you really want to focus on opening that dialogue from day one. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And I think it's fun when the kids know that they can expect things from you. You know, even though I'm the teacher, I'm yeah. in charge, you can expect things from me. And here are the things that I'm I'm going to be offering to you, just like I'm going to expect things from you. So they know it's a two-way street. Yeah, I, I, I used to do something similar with my own students. Like what I used to kind of pull them at the beginning of the year and I'd say, like, what are the non-negotiables for me? Like what what is it now? So some students will be like, no homework, or I never gave homework, so that didn't really apply. But like they'll be like, you can't give us tests or everyone gets an A. And they're gonna say those types of things, but then that's where your expectations come in and you go, listen, guys, I have to do these things, right? What can I do to make you more successful? So um, how do you respond? Like, do you need two emails to remind you of an event? One before, one the day of? Like, what can I do to support you in your learning, right? So Danielle says she only has one role in her chemistry class and that students wear goggles. Um, and they'll be expect expected to participate and observe from a safe distance. That's a good rule to have. Rules are okay if they're for safety, absolutely, because setting the expectation that they're going to be safe and being very specific about rules in the science lab are two separate things. So Danielle, I'm totally cool with those rules as a science teacher myself. Um, I totally understand why that's important. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So we're getting to about 30 minutes here, Jen, and we've covered a lot of stuff. So what I'd like to do, since we have so many people watching from basically everywhere, and if you're watching live, just put hashtag live. And if you're watching this on the replay, put hashtag replay and tell us if you're just joining us where you are joining us from. But I'd like to open it up to a little bit of a Q&A, okay? Um, so do you guys have any questions about getting the grid started? And while we're waiting, do you have any final thoughts, Jen? Um, that, and while we're waiting for some questions, if there are any, do you have any final thoughts on kind of starting this weird, uncertain year? <laughs> so an another idea is, you know, even though we're virtual, it's like, it it's almost like we don't have that contact with the kids as much. So an idea for just giving them something tangible when we can't be in the same presence together is mailing them something, mailing them a little card, a little piece of candy. I mean, just like in, we're in class, we wanna drop them something. We can send them an air hug. We could send them a new book or something if they, whatever was, was something they needed to achieve at a certain level, like just dropping that's kind of old school, right? Sending them a little package or a little note that says, hey, I'm thinking about you, you worked really hard. I think that will, that will just up the ante, you know, that will just improve that connection and that the tangible piece, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, wow. I just had an amazing question come in and I, I want to talk about it, but I also want to talk about from a leadership standpoint, that's important too. Like sending that stuff to teachers, I think is super important, but teachers connecting with the families with a physical card, a little handwritten note, it goes a really long way. Um, long, further than you probably think, right? Um, and yeah, absolutely. Mark said, and they can keep that note forever. So a Facebook user, I, I don't have your name because it just says Facebook user and you need to set permissions uh, it, with the uh, StreamYard, which is the service that we use. So if you set those permissions, I'll be able to tell you who you are. So I'm sorry, I don't know who asked this questions. However, they came late, but do you do grid training for parents? And absolutely, you need to kind of go over this with your parents. Absolutely. Jen, you look like you want to talk, so I'm going to stop talking for just a second. No, I love that idea. Absolutely. One of our, um, that my teachers, she was a fifth grade teacher. She actually did a video and she introduced her, the, the, her parents to the grid and she walked them through. Here's level one. Here's what it looks like in my classroom. Here's what it looks like when the kids are working. Here's how we connect. Here's what these cups do. So, and she sent that and just posted it to all the parents. And that was more impactful, I think, than reading all about the grid. So anyway, it's a great idea. Yes. Absolutely. So Van Scott says he plans to involve parents in the first grid to ensure they understand how it works. So yes, Van, we've had a couple people. Van was part of our workshop last month. Um, we have a couple people that are in there this month that are actually putting in their first intro grid. They're actually putting in like boxes that parents have to do with their kids right? So then the, they have to take the grid home and the parent has to do it with the student so they understand how it works. Um, obviously, sending the letters home is really important, explaining the grid, but if, and video is a great way to do it. Honestly, video is an awesome way to do it. Jen, I love your idea. Walk around your room, show them the grid. This is a grid. It's going to be coming home with your kid or it's going to be in our classroom and your students can work at their own pace. I'm going to tell you right now, I guarantee you, I bet a lot of money on this. Um, videos will get 10 times more plays and views than a written letter or email that gets sent home. Um, it's quicker, it's more concise, and parents will consume it. You can also post it on your classroom video. So here's the other cool thing. Just because you make a video and send it in an email doesn't mean you can't save that video and put it other places. Put it on your classroom Facebook page. Put it on your Google Classroom. Um, put it on your school website, put it in multiple places, and then send a letter home as well with a QR code that takes them to that video, right? So now it's a single video that now gets spread across multiple communication channels. One thing I want everyone to remember with virtual learning or communication with stakeholders, it's not about them coming to you. We have to go where they are. 
right? We can't expect everyone to change their media routines, change their social routines to fit the box that we want them to fit in, right? If I'm using Remind, but I don't like Remind as a parent, I'm not gonna just sign up for Remind because you told me to, okay? It's not part of my normal thing. So you need to put a lot of different things um, in place. We got a ton of comments. I can't even keep up with them because our audience is so amazing, Jen. I'm trying, I'm trying to read all of them as we go. Um, there was one thing. Uh, so someone said extensions for the in the intro grid. So this is actually really important, I think, Jen. Teachers can reduce their stress when they're making their intro grid a little bit. It doesn't have to necessarily be perfect DOK. It doesn't necessarily have to have that level five extension. Maybe it's three levels, right? Maybe it's like a really short mini baby grid and like, that's okay. So I know that like in the workshops, in the training, wherever you kind of learned this methodology from, whether I told it to you or not, um, wherever you kind of learn this from, you're probably thinking, well, is that DOK level one or two? Like relax with that when you're making your, when your first intro grid, like, I'd like it to increase in complexity. That'd be nice, but it like it doesn't have to be perfect. You can like just just back off. Like it's it, relax a little bit with that stuff, right? <laughs> so I have an idea though for an extension if they want yeah. one. Yeah. Maybe I should have answered the question. That would have been probably better, huh? <laughs> what well, would be an so extension? I agree with you. Test? Yes. I think that Yes, I think they can totally sit back and relax on this one. Um, you might have some of those really speedy flyers who need something. So True. one of the higher levels could be um, they teach their parents how the grid works. So design a little mini lesson for your parents to teach them how the grid works. Um, another one would be um, to design a grid for something simple that you need to do every week in your house, like maybe chores. Like every week I need to start and I need I make my bed, brush my teeth, whatever, and they can make their own kind of grid like that. So anyway, those are just a couple of things where they're actually creating or teaching about the grid that could be helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Um, so Jean uh, Brandt just said, is there an example grid somewhere? Is there an example intro grid? So here's kind of the deal with the intro grids. I can show you an example intro grid, but it's not going to work for you. Okay. So like, like, cause every single person has a different style. Every single person does different things, has different accounts they want people to set up. Um, we don't have a ton of them. There are some in the fa private Facebook group at teachbettergroup.com. Um, there are a couple floating around in there, but I'm going to be telling you right now that like looking at one of these is pretty standard across the board. Think about the things you do in the first two weeks of school and then apply that to a grid. Like that that's the basic ideology behind an introduction grid. It's much less stressful than designing a content grid. It should be a little fun as you think about how you want to get to know your students and the activities. I know for me, like, like uh, Edmodo or my learning management software was really important a lot. Um, and, and so I'd have my students set up their accounts and do a fake quiz that told me about themselves and things like that. So um, it's really simple. Don't stress about the intro grid, but just make it purposeful, right? Think about what you normally do in, in, in the beginning of the school year. I think Beth asked for a video up there. Let's see a video. I think it was the parent video. So another teacher filmed that. So I'll check with her. And if I can, um, if I can share that with you out, I'll message it to you. Ah, uh, Beth Moore. She asked if you can share the video. Yes. Ray Hewitt also does a great video every single year. Um, and that's a really quick video you can do. Just, just take it on your cell phone guys. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. So here's a, here's a, here's a yes. piece with video. Now, if you're watching me on video, you already know that I follow this rule but it does not have to be perfect. <laughs> it does not have to be perfect. You authentic is much better than you like a robot, like reading a script and it's really boring. And this is what the grid is like you being authentically excited and passionate about what you're going to do with your students is going to catch their attention. So just be authentic, be yourself, share that passion with the parents. And I guarantee you like sending that video out before the year starts, 
Also, send a video out that tells them how excited you are that they're going to be coming to your classroom and that they're going to see you, right? If you're starting the year remotely, let them see your face, hear your voice. Let them see your whole face before they see it like this all year, right? Um, it's absolutely, absolutely important to do that. So, Jen, it's been a, a pretty long chat uh, already, and we've had so many awesome people just posing questions. I'm going to open it up one more time for any additional questions. Um, real quick, we're going to do like a little bit of wait time. I'm just joking. <laughs> but um, are there any parting thoughts you have um, as a new leader, um, as an, a very experienced grid veteran, um, instructional coach, and using it in the classroom? Are there any thoughts you have, uh, parting words of wisdom you could, you could, you could give everybody? This year is going to be different and the kids are going to bring anxiety and worry from their parents, from their families, from their own anxiety, from not being in school or just, just this overall worry about the world right now. And so we have the opportunity to model how to be flexible, um, how to go with the flow, how to be lenient. Like, Oh, you forgot about that. That's, that's okay. It happens. So I, I just feel like this is a really good time to just model compassion and kindness and that we're okay. Like we can get through this and, and just that whole resilience piece, I think, I think is important to, to model for kids during this time. So don't, I, I'd say don't sweat the small stuff and just enjoy because I'm so excited to go back to school, yeah. no matter how we are there. <laughs> Absolutely. I could not have said that better myself, Jen. Um, I want to thank every single person for participating, for all your great questions and comments and just everything. This was an awesome chat. And we will see you, and I think the next one's in like two weeks or something for next month. Um, but that should be a good one yeah. because everyone's going to be going back yeah. to school at that point. So it should be um, even more exciting. But Jen, as always, you were amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and everyone else, have a fantastic evening. And as always, Stay awesome. Bye, everybody.